everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the fifth webinar in the Insights Outreach Series hosted by the DHS Science and Technology Office of Industry Partnerships. In this series, we want to help you navigate S&T's partnership opportunities, understand DHS mission needs, and identify paths to funding to help get the best Homeland Security solutions to market faster. We invite you to join us the first Tuesday of every month for the webinar series. You can find a list of upcoming webinars and recordings of our previous videos on the DHS s and events page. During today's webinar, you will learn more about s and Silicon Valley Innovation Program, or SVIP. Please note that if you have any questions or comments, be sure to put them in the Q&A chat box. With that, I will introduce Melissa O, oh, SVIP Managing Director. Melissa? Great, thanks Connie. Uh, uh, thanks for the intro and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, as, uh, as Connie mentioned, my name is Melissa O. Oh. I'm the Managing Director for the Silicon Valley Innovation Program. Um, uh, hope you all had a great weekend and, uh, and are joining us from wherever you're joining us from. Um, just wanted to give a little bit of um, background on the Silicon Valley Innovation Program um, and, then, uh, and then actually introduce you to a couple of startups that we have under our portfolio to give you a flavor for um, how it is to work with SVIP, you know, what, it, what's, what their experience has been and uh, answer any questions. So as she mentioned, if you've got a question, feel free to throw it into the Q&A box and we'll get to it uh, um, during the open Q&A session after the fireside chat. Um, so just a bit about the Silicon Valley Innovation Program. We launched this program about five and a half years ago. Um, and with the, with the intention of really engaging the startup community, um, the small businesses that are working in the commercial emerging tech sector, um, identifying and realizing that there's a lot of innovation that's occurring um, in this space. And DHS and the federal government could be better utilizing that, uh, that amazing technology that's being developed. Um, and so part of what SVIP does is we cultivate the relationship. We help educate the community uh, as to what DHS's mission is, um, help you understand all the different agencies that fall within DHS, what we're looking for, um, and then also to innovate, um, leverage those commercial investments that are being made by the tech sector, uh, adapt those products, um, have them consider opening the aperture of their, of their solutions, but not, um, not adapt uh, or not pivot off their commercial roadmap. Um, but that way, uh, in, in addition to having a commercial focus of your product line, uh, you're also able to sell to the federal government as well. Um, so who, who specifically does SVIP work with? Um, we work with startups um, or small businesses with less than 200 employees. Um, and, that, and that number includes any of your sub subsidiary companies or parent companies. We really are targeting a specific group of companies that is, um, that's innovative and, and really small. Um, and generally speaking, have been pre-A, pre-B series coming out of an, a, an angel round or a seed round. Um, but really we are looking for interesting talent and good products. Um, and so it, it, that doesn't necessarily mean you're not eligible. So um, take a look at our eligibility, um, but uh, um, the, the size of the company matters as well as um, uh, what we call non-traditional companies. That's um, basically a non, um, or companies that have not had a US federal government uh, FAR-based contract, that's federal acquisition regulation. So if you know what FAR means, then you probably aren't eligible. But uh, essentially, if you've had that type of contract or grant totaling over a million dollars within the last 12 months. So we really are specifically interested in working with companies who have not really um, uh, broken into the federal government space before um, and is working in the uh, commercial tech sector. Um, and as I've been mentioning, um, our, we're really focused on those uh, companies that are commercially focused. They have a product roadmap that uh, is looking to uh, really make it in uh, commercially, um, but that they're willing to just open the aperture to bake in DHS's needs. We're looking for um, essentially companies where we would have mutual benefit. Essentially, um, you're working on something commercially. Um, we, the federal government, could could better utilize um, good commercial products that are out there, but we can't actually acquire them unless they actually meet DHS's needs. So this, this is uh, the way we have focused the program is that the funding that we provide is to adapt, uh, adapt your commercial product to addressing our needs. We work with US and international companies um, and uh, you'll actually hear from um, both uh, today. Um, so say you're a startup, how can you engage? Um, please follow us follow s and um, and you'll be notified of any new funding opportunities and topics that we have out there. Right now, we don't have any um, 
active topics, but I'm looking to have one um, come out this fall um, supporting FEMA um, in the insure tech space. So if you know of anyone that's in that space uh, or are interested in it, um, please you know, um, ask to join our mailing list um, and or connect with me on LinkedIn as we, um, as we have new topics and new funding opportunities, I share that out um, a, a good amount. And so um, please follow us that way. Next slide, please. So the way the program works is um, we have um, we put out the pr the problem set. Um, we uh, I myself and my team work with the operational agencies within DHS to to identify what their pain points are and uh, and lay out a specific use cases uh, that they're trying to address. Um, and that way, you know, as a company, that there is a dedicated um, uh, 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 customer that's looking for a solution. Um, and so um, we're not actually uh, we don't just get tech tech ideas um, through our uh, through our intake me method. Um, we really put out the problem set, the use case, um, and that's what we call a topic call um, and lay out exactly what we're looking for. Um, and once you take a look at that, see if that meets what you are developing um, for your commercial product and, uh, and then submit an application. Um, our application process is about 10 pages. And what we're asking you to do is lay out what your commercial product is and how it can be adapted to DHS's needs. What, what amount of funding is going to be required to address that, and um, and the idea is that we're we're complementary to your roadmap and your milestones already. So uh, think about it that way: is that we're not asking you to pivot too far, but just open the aperture. If we like the application, we'll invite the company to do a 15-minute or uh, virtual pitch, and uh, I'll usually give a, a courtesy decision within 48 hours uh, by phone. Um, and usually, our contracts are awarded um, in on average about 45 days. Um, so that's pretty quick um, in terms of government speak and, and contracting, uh, and that's usually our process. Um, each each cycle of the topic call may have multiple application deadlines and pitch site uh, and and uh, and the pitch schedule. So really, the award timeline is after a decision is made on the pitch, um, and that's using something called the other transaction agreement. Um, it's basically a very uh, similar to a commercial contract. Next slide, please. So in summary, actually, the, the, the way the program works is we have four phase gates, four program, uh, four phases in which we are um, uh, progressively determining whether or not the product is meeting the needs of the government. And uh, and each each contract, each uh, each project um, will um, uh, get anywhere between 200 and $2, and $2 million over the course of 24 months. And it really kind of depends on the cycle at which the, the um, products are being developed. Um, in many cases, some of these are sprint projects where the first phase um, can be as short as three months, um, in which case your overall project timeline could be as short as 12 months. Um, and this is essentially three to four tranches of non-dilutive funding, uh, 50 to 500K per phase. Um, and so uh, take, uh, think about it in terms of uh, we are non-recurring engineering costs to adapt your product um, with the first phase being that we want to see a, a proof of concept demonstration. You're, you're far enough along in your commercial development of your product, um, perhaps a, a, a beta prototype phase where you are still in a position where you can adapt your product. Um, and, uh, and, and by that end of phase one, you're demonstrating that, that this, is, this is a solution that, you can, that we can work on together. Phase two is where you're actually baking in, you're full, uh, fully baking in uh, the requirements from DHS. Phase three, we're actually doing uh, functional red team testing, making sure uh, it actually does what it says it's supposed to do and, and actually um, work out any of the uh, security and privacy kinks. And by phase four, we're doing um, operational uh, testing in the environment. Um, the expectation is that you're actually working with the um, operational customer, the end user throughout all four phases and, and iterating and, and refining your product. Um, so that by phase four, you're actually testing a product that could be um, readily uh, um, used in the field. And, and following that, uh, the, ex, uh, the intention would be to acquire or license or something um, for, uh, to that effect by the government. Next slide, please. Um, so in general, um, the benefits to startups that we have, um, we have uh, observed is in addition to um, the non-dilutive funding, it's equity free. We're not interested in taking any IP uh, from the company either. We're just interested in a good product to, that hits the commercial mar marketplace that will meet DHS's needs. There's a broad network within DHS and our international partners that we work with. Um, and uh, we have a, a good number of companies that, uh, that, uh, that have worked with us. And so uh, you could look at them as mentors as well as the government program managers that you'd be working with. 
Um, essentially, in terms of market validation, uh, we are a uh, we have problems that have uh, ha uh, that need solutions, and so it's essentially a, a baked in market validation. Uh, and the DHS uh, enterprise is quite large. Um, you're talking not just DHS agencies, but also first responder communities and, and the like. Um, my program is very, um, uh, I, I don't do anything classified. So we do press releases, we announce all new awards. So uh, our goal is to really help you amplify your reach, um, reach new investors, reach new government customers. Um, and a number of our companies have told us that they have raised uh, follow on funding um, and raised their next round of capital as a result of having the project and being able to speak to the project uh, that they're working on with us. Next slide, please. So this just um, is a flavor for the various topics that we've done over the course of the last five and a half years, everything from internet of things security to uh, canine wearables to uh, aviation security and blockchain and, uh, and, all, and of course uh, the more recent COVID-19 response um, where we were able to quickly um, put out some um, use cases and needs that, uh, that our DHS uh, partners are, were interested in. Um, so that's just to give you a flavor, uh, as I mentioned before, we don't have any current topics out there, but um, be on the lookout in the fall. We're hoping to have uh, at least one more topic with FEMA and perhaps another one um, uh, uh, to, to, sh to shortly follow after that. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so uh, I actually wanted to get to know who our audience is. And so we've got a couple polls that uh, we, that hopefully you guys will respond to. Um, I'd like to know, you know, like where are you all coming from? Um, we've got a number of, uh, of companies that are, you know, um, part of our portfolio that are international, but all over the country. I, it, even though I'm based in Silicon Valley, we actually have funded a number of companies all over the, all over the US as well as the world. Um, and I'm actually really curious, as I've kind of mentioned, um, the way our program works is that we like to adapt, uh, our, our, the goal is to adapt current, current uh, commercial emerging uh, technologies. And so I'm, I'm curious where you all see sort of the most interesting emerging technologies coming out from. So um, that's, uh, please, uh, please fill out the poll. I'd really love to hear from you and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and learn from you. Um, but uh, coming up next also is our fireside chat. I've got uh, a couple of portfolio companies I wanted to introduce you to, give you sort of their perspective in, in their experience in working with SVIP. Um, and as I mentioned before, if you've got any questions, feel free to throw them into the Q&A box and we'll get to them uh, after the fireside chat uh, during the open Q&A period. Um, so hopefully you've had a chance to um, respond to the poll. Um, and so I think let's close it and, and see what people have said. All right, very interesting. Uh, love, love the responses. And it uh, looks like we've got folks from all over the place. Um, gr great representation from the Northeast and Southeast. Uh, and, uh, oh, very interesting, great. I, <clears throat> not, not surprising that uh, general AI is, uh, is, is some of the most interesting uh, uh, emerging tech that's coming out. But uh, obviously as our, as our current world has, it has, it has experienced very recently, a lot of, a lot of interesting, um, uh, innovation is coming out of uh, out of uh, this disruption that we've seen in the world. Um, great. Well, thank you for for taking the poll. Uh, and next slide, please. All right. Well, today's speakers um, uh, that I've had that, that I've asked to join us today are Dr. Bob Baxley. Um, he is the chief technology officer from Bastille, which is a company based in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and, uh, and our uh, second speaker is Andrew Butt. He is the founder and chief executive officer for iProof, um, which is a company based in the United Kingdom. Um, so really excited to have both of them here to share um, with you what they have been working on um, and, uh, and really their experience with SVIP. But I first asked them to um, give a few, uh, take a few minutes to help you understand as a company who they were, um, uh, who they are, uh, and and commercially what they were focused on, and then and then we'll get into the fireside chat discussion as to how it was that they they viewed the use case, the problem set that DHS put out there, and how they made the determination that this would this would be a good problem set for them to um, to tackle with us um, collaboratively. So thanks. Uh, hopefully that uh, gave you a good flavor for SVIP, and uh, and uh, over to you, Bob. Thanks, Melissa. Um, great intro. Uh, so yeah, as Melissa said, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes just telling you what we do here at Bastille. Uh, this is a quick four or five slide overview. So go ahead to the next slide, please. So we've built a radio frequency detection system that involves these software defined radio sensor arrays. So these physical devices are a little bit bigger than Wi-Fi access points. 
and you're putting one of these sensors every 50 to 100 feet in a grid pattern in your facility. They're doing software to find demodulation of all the radio frequency emissions and networks and protocols in a facility. Um, so what that means, we're able to take the R of energy and turn it into ones and zeros and turn those one and zeros into packets. So much like you'd have visibility on your wired network traffic, we give you the visit that same visibility for all the radio frequency device traffic in your space. Could be IoT devices, could be wearables, could be phones, laptops, any devices transmitting RF, we give you that visibility. Now we don't see the payloads of packet transmissions, but we do see the existence of emitters. We understand what network a device is connected to, which devices are connected together. And we see unencrypted header information like the device manufacturer, or sometimes the device name, these kinds of things. Uh, so we give you that, that data visibility. In addition to that, because we have multiple sensors deployed, we can geolocate each transmitter in your space. So the net result is our users see an, uh, a floor plan map interface and overlaid on that floor plan map are, uh, is a dot for each radio frequency emitter in their space. And as those devices move physically or as they move from network to network, all that gets displayed on this map. And then finally, we record data your data for whatever your retention policy is. So you can scroll back in time and say, where was this device uh, 30 days ago at two in the morning? Or was there a device in this restricted area at you know, a year ago at two in the morning? We can answer all those kinds of questions. Next slide, please. So here's a quick video demonstration to make this a little more real. So on the left is our Bastille user interface. On the right, we have two camera systems deployed in our radio lab in Atlanta. So you can see on the left, we see the real-time dots of where all the emitters are. Sloan here has just walked into the facility. She has a phone, Wi-Fi is off, Bluetooth is off, but she is transmitting cellular energy. And so we can geolocate that, that cellular transmission. And I've geofenced a room in our facility such that if there's a cellular transmitter in that room, that violates our device policy. And we will create a security instant ticket we will send an SMS to the security personnel. And in this case, we will also, we've integrated with the camera system to have the camera slew, that is pan, tilt, and zoom into that space. So we're not a camera system. This is just one demonstration of an integration between Bastille and some other enterprise system you have. This one is more focused on physical security. We have integrations into cybersecurity systems like Palo Alto and Cisco and Aruba as well. Um, but that gives you some sense, some sense of what we're doing. You can see on your map where emitters are as they move throughout your space. Next slide, please. Uh, so just a, a feeling for how the architecture is laid out. You can deploy sensors, these Bastille sensors in a facility. And if you've got a multi-campus uh, enterprise, you can deploy sensors across campuses Inside a particular building, they connect to an appliance, and that each one of those appliances connects to a central Bastille fusion center. And we can deploy that on-premise or in your private cloud. And ultimately, your operators are using a web interface from the fusion center to see devices and see data from any or all of the, the facilities in their campus. Next slide. So that's what we're doing, a little bit of company background. We were founded in 2014. We've raised about $45 million in, in venture capital. Our, our two lead investors are Bench, uh, Bessemer Venture Partners and Comcast. Um, our founding engineering team came out of uh, the DARPA Spectrum Challenge. So there was a 90 team competition that DARPA held and we have engineers from the first, second, third and fourth place teams. Um, I, I was previously at Georgia Tech um, before Bastille, and I got second place in that competition. I had the pleasure of hiring the guy who beat me, so that, that was a, some nice revenge there. He's still at Bastille helping program our FPGAs. We've got facilities in Silicon Valley, so right at, in um, South of Market Street in San Francisco where we do our enterprise software work. We've got a radio lab in Atlanta, and then we've got a demo center in Herndon, Virginia. So if you're in the D.C. area and this technology is of interest to you, we'd love to host you there and we can walk you through live these kinds of demonstrations. On the customer side, we've got both commercial and federal uh, customers. So think largest tech bank and hedge fund customers are, are kind of our marquee customers. We're doing things like providing RF visibility for C-suites, providing RF visibility for data centers. We're deployed to several Fortune 50 companies. 
And then in federal DOD IC, we've got lots of deployments. So we've got a deployment in a building larger than the Superdome, for instance. Uh, 26 patents issued so far, and everything's designed and manufactured in the US. Um, next slide. So I, I think that's the end of my section, and I'm going to hand it over to Andrew if I got that right. Yeah, over to you, Andrew. Thank you very much indeed, Bob. Um, uh, and thanks a lot. Um, I'm Andrew Budd. I'm London-based founder and CEO of iProve. Uh, my back, I'm a serial entrepreneur. This is the third time that um, I, I built a tech-based business. Never before in cybersecurity, never before in government affairs. My background was in mobile. So I was one of the founders of one of the first European uh, digital cellular uh, operator carriers. And uh, before iProve, uh, my big business was in the in I, in Mblox, a company that pioneered enterprise to consumer text messaging. And prior to working with uh, the SVIP, um, I, I, I'd never actually had a, a government customer uh, before. So this whole thing was an, a new experience, and I'm looking forward to sharing uh, some of that experience um, with you. Next slide, please. So our task is to enable organizations to establish trust in remote users. These are users uh, in untrust, uh, these are potentially untrusted users in untrusted locations with untrusted hardware running over, un, uh, hardware, untrusted software uh, running over untrusted networks. And yet, despite the absolute absence of any um, trustworthy elements along the chain, including the device, um, the task is to establish trust in that remote user. And we do that using face verification. Um, the face verification has a number of tremendous advantages when you're trying to authenticate a person. You can be authenticating the person uh, for the first time against a, a government issued ID, tr a trusted ID credential, such as a, a driving license or a passport, when you're onboarding them to create a new account, uh, say to set up a new visa or immigration request or um, a, a, a social security uh, account um, or a medical, some sort of medical record. Um, and you can also use authentic facial verification um, as an authentication mechanism when the person returns and you're comparing their face against trusted previous uh, versions of themselves and you're testing persistence. So um, face as an onboarding mechanism and face as one as an authentication factor. Uh, these are two big applications of it. And the reason it's great is that um, it's so simple. I look at my device, it looks back at me. What could be simpler? And many of us, were, we're very familiar with this. The challenge is not as many people think to establish to, to do the face recognition, but, but to establish that the face that you're recognizing is actually genuinely present and is not an artifact. It's not a it's not an artifact, it's not a piece of deep fake imagery, it's not a forgery, either a physical or a digital forgery of the person uh, made by an attacker. And if you can do that, then you've assured, then you've done what we call the assurance of genuine presence. And that's what we specialize in assuring the genuine presence of a person, no matter what their device. Uh, no matter what their context, and ensure that we can deliver high levels of trust in a way that is both uh, device independent and also incredibly easy so as to be um, uh, highly inclusive. Next slide, please. So just a few words about the business. Uh, we, um, uh, uh, the business has been, has been trading since 2013. Um, when we when we won the for our first SDIP uh, phase one contract, we were about uh, 25 people. Now we're actually um, over 75. I think we've just recruited our 80th person. Based very much in London, all of our technology was developed in London by our London-based staff. We have a rapidly growing um, base in Washington DC and another one in Singapore, uh, and a rapidly growing patent portfolio, largely funded by. Um, innovation grants from the UK and also by Series A funding in 2019, we raised about uh, six million dollars. We today declare social, we declare market leadership in specific in the specific area of biometric verification by means of software as a service, as opposed to on device, and that we and that leadership is based upon a numerous strategic deployments worldwide. So our customers, people, organisations using our technology today um, include the UK Home Office. The National Health Service, the government of Singapore, uh, the Australian government, and numerous banks worldwide, including majors like uh, ING Bank, Rubber Bank, uh, and uh, um, 
uh, Standard Bank in South Africa and many others. We have a couple of very large deployments um, in the United States that we can't actually talk about yet. And we're talking here about tens of millions of users iProving every month, backed up by uh, many certific security certifications, including crucially um, the red team certification that was done as part of our transit, as part of our phase three. Uh, and we've won, won uh, lots of nice uh, awards, which is just great. Next slide, please. So let, in a second, let me give you a demo to just show how this works. What Joe is doing here is he aligns this cartoon version of his face. It flashes, the screen flashes at him for a few seconds. And uh, after about three or four seconds, he's been assured. Uh, let me just explain what happened. We generate a, 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 a high entropy code in our servers, which we send to the device. That tells the device what colors to flash on the screen. While the screen is flashing, perhaps if you run the video again, um, uh, while the screen is flashing, it's illuminating his face, and we're capturing a very short video of his face, which we send back to our servers. You'll see the light reflecting off his face there. We're capturing the video of his face. We're analyzing the reflection, the reflection of the light from his face. We're looking both at the spatial and spectral characteristics, which tell us whether it's an artifact, a screen, a photograph, or a mask. But we're also looking for the, to ensure that that one-time sequence of colors is correctly replicated on his face um, in, the, in the reflections. If it's not, then we're looking at a highly accurate deep fake or a, a, a replayed recording. Uh, you'll notice he didn't have to do anything. The line drawing of his face was there mainly to ensure that he didn't get any selfie anxiety. So it's extremely inclusive, but it's also very secure and it fitted in with one of, with a, in a very timely manner, um, with a, an SVIP call um, that we were successful in meeting and that frankly changed our business. Um, thank you very much. Great, thanks, Andrew uh, and and Bob. Uh, uh, hopefully, that uh, gave everyone a, a, a good feel and snapshot for um, uh, the, the the two companies that are in our portfolio. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask uh, Bob and Andrew to join me uh, for our, uh, the fireside chat now. Um, uh, and if um, if uh, if if you all could um, let us know. Um, if you, if you could each speak to, you know, like what was it that got you interested in SVIP when you heard about it? Um, like, how did you envision adapting what you were already developing commercially um, and, and you heard about the SVIP call and, and felt, okay, I think actually I can, I, I, you know, I, I'm interested in working with DHS. This is, this is in line with what we are working on. So if you guys could uh, share what you thought about, uh, about that, it'd be helpful. Go ahead, Andrew. Thanks, Bob. Um, uh, when we read the call, it was quite uncanny because uh, we only had a very short time to read the call um, before the deadline. In fact, I only saw the call 12 and a half hours before the closing time, which made it which made it really quite, quite exciting. However, reading the call, it was speaking to us. It was obvious that what was necessary for uh, to solve one of the major problems was what we had been working on at that point for four years. Uh, the at that time, the, the, the DHS, the past, it was a call about um, fast and fluid, fast and fluid transit across borders, both airport borders and land borders. And one of the requirements was the ability for a person to cross a land border without the physical presence of a CBP officer. And there were some absolutely delightful examples given, um, which I, I still treasure to this day, including um, uh, uh, the Northwest Angle and other places. Um, it was immediately apparent that what the DHS needed was a way to assure, to, to authenticate a, pers a, a, a remote border crossing, a, a traveler crossing the border against uh, their passport or their, in their, their Nexus card or their TVS record. But it was going to be absolutely essential for this to be worth anything at all, that, they, that, they should, that the DHS could be, should be able to assure the genuine presence of the traveler. And that's what we did. So there was an absolutely perfect match between our core technology and what the DHS needed. Of course, there was going to be a significant amount of work in actually um, adapting the overall solution to the requirements of the JHS systems. But that just made it exciting for us. Bob? Yeah, we had very similar, um, very similar thing happen. So we actually heard about the program from a colleague who had won a phase one, another Atlanta company, Ionic. Uh, and so we checked it out and just by coincidence, they had an IoT, SVIP had an IoT security call out and they contemplated agent-based IoT security where you put an app on an IoT device kind of network-based where you've got network tracking, but over a wired network or a TCP IP network. 
And the last thing that was contemplated in the call for proposals was a RF monitoring of IoT devices, which was exactly what we were what we were building. Um, you know, we were contemplating, we were doing policy enforcement and um, physical security use cases. Having someone like DHS say what we, what is needed in this space, or one of the things that's needed is IoT security for critical infrastructure was really helpful. Like you, Andrew, they had some nice use cases in there and that, that helped us home in on a solution that DS, DHS would procure. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks to you both. I, I, uh, uh, I think you actually touched on the next question I was going to ask, which was that what was the DHS use case? But I think you both covered that uh, very, very well already. So, um, uh, thanks, thanks for that. Um, I, I, you know, I really like hearing, you know, how it was that a company came about to realizing that this is this is in lockstep and, and complementary to what you're already developing. Because, as I've mentioned, you know, I really want this program to be mutually beneficial. It's not just that we're trying to, um, you know. Get, get every startup to work with DHS. I mean, obviously we wanna lower the barrier for, for startups to working with DHS, but it has to make sense uh, for every company. Um, uh, I think you, you've touched on it, but if you, if, you all, if you wouldn't mind, you know, talking about some of the other benefits that you've had um, and, and gained as a result of working on the program. Um, I mentioned, you know, having heard from some other companies uh, uh, in the portfolio about raising additional capital, but what were some of the other benefits that, you, that you've seen uh, as part of working with, uh, with us? Well, for us, it was it was getting better use case clarity, especially in the DOD federal space. So actually getting to talk to CBP agents and federal service people and other DHS components uh, was really useful for refining use cases. Another nice benefit was once you have a DHS contract, and that's, you know, as you said, Melissa, you could, this is, the press releases are public. So we don't have to be cagey about this government customer we have. We've got a forward thinking giant government customer in DHS and that helps us go talk to other government customers. So your cold calls tend to get returned more when you've got, when you've got that kind of existence proof with a previous customer. Um, so I, I think those were the, the two big benefits. And then as, as you alluded to, it certainly didn't hurt with fundraising. You know, As an early stage startup, you're counting customers in ones, twos, you know, dozens. And so having DHS as a customer is hugely helpful in, in raising capital. What about you, Andrew? So, so um, yeah, it's interesting, great similarity. Um, we, we got lots of benefits. It was a business changer for us. Um, the first thing is, you know, you invent a new technology. It's Jeffrey Moore's crossing the chasm. You invent a new technology and you think that it's gonna be useful for, for something. And then you kind of grub around for some years trying to prove that people want it, want it for that purpose. And you find out you're wrong and you start to discover that, in fact, people want it for completely other purposes that you've never dreamed of. So establishing establishing a real concrete use case, um, discovering an application for this that was genuinely important and compelling was extremely instructive for us. Um, it gave us confidence that we were working on the right line and it gave us a clue as to future use cases in completely different contexts which would have many of the same characteristics. So that was the, that was the first thing. The second was that um, the PR impact of it was enormous, enormous. Um, the DHS issued a press release saying that we had um, received this grant. And we, as it happens, we were the first ever non-US company to, um, to, to receive such a grant. And um, the, 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 the press release went public. Uh, the result was that I ended up, I ended up on BBC World Television. Um, in front of 100 million viewers. It, it had an, just the association of the Department of Homeland Security with a, a, a tiny little company in a derelict office, in a derelict building in central London, was a credibility maker. As a result of that, people started, other customers started to take us seriously, both in the US and, and overseas. And it, led, and it then led to the ability, not just to raise funding, which we did uh, a bit over a year later, but just to get other customers. Because in particular in the cybersecurity area, people never know quite who to trust in their references. But if, the, if it was good enough for the DHS, then it's probably good enough for us. Um, and the third was that it was just, frankly, we've just enjoyed getting involved in the youth cases. You know, our work with the, C we've been working with a fantastic team at the CBP, which has actually taught us a lot about um, the integration aspects of our technology. Um, but we're still hoping to cross to, we're still looking forward as part of the benefit of working uh, with, with in the program and with 
TVP to go across to Drummond Island on a snowmobile. Wow, uh, uh, I did. I actually didn't know that about the BBC, but that's that's awesome, Andrew. Uh, and, and thanks for thanks for those anecdotes, Bob. Um, I uh, I was actually also meant. You know, I'd like to mention that one of the other benefits that I found very fascinating, interesting in the program is, you know, this is this is a, a program in which the government is recognizing that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of R and D being funded in the commercial sector already, right? So, you know, how is it that the government could take advantage of commercial R and D that's existing? You know, this is kind of a flip flop of, of of days past in terms of when the government used to be the bigger R and D funder. Um, what was what is an interesting observation I've had is that some of the adaptations that our companies have um, have incorporated into their product lines have have also then yielded. A new, a new pendulum swing where the, the product that, that, the, that the government helped to fund um, that was adapting commercial is now also swinging back to another commercial um, in a totally different sector, you know, like in, you know, in, in the cases of, uh, of, of uh, media even, you know, where like um, cybersecurity for drones on, 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 a, on, a, on and, and having, having media companies realize, you know, like I want, I want, you know, my content to be secure too. So just a totally different anecdote, but I thought it was an interesting uh, benefit that I see in, in working with the, in working with startups, not just in better mission capabilities, but also then seeing some, um, some interesting uh, turnabouts uh, for those companies in, in working in other commercial sectors as well. We, we, we actually had that experience, Melissa. So one of the things that came out of the DHS interaction is, users wanted a portable version of our system. You know, our, our typical system, you deploy sensors and you get 24 seven monitoring in a facility and they stay there forever. Uh, but there's DHS users who wanna take our sensors and move them places. They wanna vet a facility or vet a data center. And so we built this portable system we call the flyway kit that sensors in a, in a Pelican case that they can move around. So those, we now, my, my point though, is we now sell those to commercial users because if they're doing audits or red teaming or threat hunting, they also want that portable kit that they can move to data centers. So we, we've experienced exactly that. That's great. Yeah, I, that's, I mean, that, and that's been, that's been very beneficial for us. So I'm glad that that's been mutually beneficial for all of us. Yeah. Um, sort of like last fireside moderated question I've got was, um, you know, what would you tell a startup that's thinking of working with the US government uh, or particularly SVIP? You know, like, is there some, uh, is there a certain type of profile of a company that you would encourage or, you know, any, anything you, you wanna say about, you know, uh, to a startup thinking about it? There's no point going into this if, um, if, if you're gonna have to completely bend your business out of shape. This ultimately, this has to be something that makes sense on your roadmap. You may slightly broaden the road to several more lanes to incorporate um, uh, the, 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 the DHS's requirements, but that's fine. I mean, that's, that's what learning is about. But there's no point, there's absolutely no point in trying to shoehorn one business into uh, an imaginary, into a call just in order to try and get your hands on some money because that will hurt. Uh, but you do need to be flexible. And, and I think it's very important to be flexible and be ready to work in a, a team working is very important. You know, I think the, the alternative one, assuming that you're going to march in with a piece of technology and just stuff it down the throats of the of the grateful DHS is, of course, complete nonsense. This is team working. You have to listen, you spend a lot of time and it's enormously interesting, educational and fun time talking to operational teams. And if you like doing that stuff and we loved it. Um, then it's really interesting and it tells you things about the details of your product and how it's exploited. But you, and you have to be uh, interested in and flexible to adaptation um, and team working to the real world. Uh, you also have to be patient. I mean, the timescales over which government is able to act um, are in all cases, without exception, longer than some commercial organizations. The, 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 this SVIP program has got, has, has gone, we've gone through the SIP program faster than the procurement cycle of some co commercial organizations we've been working with. So I'm not going to, so this is actually a pretty speedy operation by some, by some cases, but if you're hoping to accomplish all your requirements and get out the door in six months, you're nuts. You know, the game, but it's a big game because everything that comes out of the back end, um, uh, is, it's going to be on a large scale. So the third thing is you've got to be ready to do government quality work at the end of it. Uh, and there are high quality restraints. There are high, in our case, the high privacy and high security obligations. And you either see that as a positive, as we did. So the, the red team for us, the red team for us, uh, this exercise was us was fantastic. 
um, because it was taking us where we wanted to be. If we'd wanted to come up with something a bit, um, a bit shoddy, a bit commercial, then that would have been a real pain in the neck. We'd have had to bend ourselves out of shape tremendously to meet government requirements because that, if you're not trying to meet government standards, then going to SVIP and the forces is going to hurt. Of meeting a government quality requirement, this is going to be this is going to be great. I think those those are the ones I would suggest. Yeah, I think that's that's a good insight. So I, I actually had a back. I could spell far before uh, before um, Bastille. I, I did government contract work at Georgia Tech, um, and so I, I was familiar with the timelines and the the typical R and D path. Like Melissa said, was government needs a widget. And they want to fund people to build a widget from the ground up, which is not this program. This, this program is realizing that there's commercial companies building something close to the widget that DHS may need, and that you may just take some small incremental funding. Um, you know, the, if you if you just the typical government contracting route is not useful for, as Andrew said, for for most kind of venture back startups who want to build a scalable product because you usually got a very narrow product targeting just that one use case. Um, so if, if you're in that lane, you know, this is probably not the program for you. If you're trying to build a scalable product and you wanna broaden your user base to DOD, federal, DHS, this, this can be a great program because you'll go find users who need almost what you have, but you need to just, you know, build a new feature or something. And we had the same experience as Andrew. You know, DHS paid to do a paid a red team group to red team our product, and uh, it was it's great to have that that piece of paper. We've done red teamings before, but now we've got a whole other a group and report that vets our product and validates it. So I, I think you know, go for it. Is is this the as long as the the call is in your area, the area that your company is working on, go for it. Fantastic. Awesome. Thanks for, thanks for those uh, words of advice. I think that it's, it's very sage for a startup because I know that it, you know, in talking to VCs, you know, we, we definitely don't want to, there's limited resources for a startup to, to actually um, succeed and, and make sure that they're developing a product that's commercially viable. Um, and then to have the government come in and say, hey, you know, I'm interested in this too. Um, we definitely want to make sure that it is aligned with what they're already developing. Um, and not not serving as a distraction, um, but as as Andrew mentioned, you know, maybe maybe if there's a couple more lanes in the road, that's 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 good, you know, like that helps. And and having the non dilutive funding to help, you know, advance those milestones and and validate validate the product uh, even further is 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 beneficial. Um, so awesome. So we're gonna jump into sort of the open Q and A, and it seems like we've got a lot of questions. So I'm gonna try and um, get through them quite quickly. Um, and uh, the first question we've got actually is. Um, you know, what happens after SVIP? You know, can a startup start selling, you know, their adapted product to DHS afterwards? Um, so the way the, and I'll take that one actually. Um, so the, the way the program is operated is, you know, uh, SVIP funds the, the adaptation of that product, but in, in lockstep and in working with an operational agency, component agency of DHS that has the intention of, of acquiring or purchasing or licensing that technology um, after, uh, after, um, they've gone through the four phases uh, nominally um, or five phases in some cases. And so we, we have structured and set up the program such that um, the, that operational agency can come in afterwards and not compete, not have to recompete um, the, the product. Um, there's, there's multiple ways in which um, that solution can be acquired. Um, and, and in some cases it's easier for a startup to work through a government reseller, for example. Uh, a lot of times the government requires um, some significant auditing that has to occur. And sometimes there are larger businesses that re that, that serve as a, like a reseller that have, have already kind of gone through um, the headache of, of doing that. Um, it, it depends on the, really the startup's business model, whether they want to be a direct um, seller to the government or they'd rather just have their product license it to to some through someone else and so there's multiple ways in which that can occur um, and uh, but 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 ultimately if if they want to sell directly to the government we have a couple of me methods in which that can be done uh, through something called a production um, OTA other transaction agreement um, or or um, or uh, a direct contracting um, but without having to require further competition because ultimately the idea is that we've already gone through this competition we've already we've already uh, validated and 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 uh, 
um, uh, adapted this product. Um, and so we, the government now just want to buy it and, and deploy it. Um, so great question there. Um, uh, one of the questions that I've seen come in is uh, also, um, and uh, by the way, if, if we didn't get to your question, please send us a, a separate email. Um, and that in, and that email address will be provided at the end because um, I, I realize we have a lot of questions and, and we want to kind of get through uh, as, as many uh, to help you all understand uh, how this works. Um, so what if we're an existing company under 100 people that's recently pivoted and while not a startup per se, we're starting uh, starting up with a new focus for our technology and product. Um, I think um, both Bob and Andrew have kind of mentioned this already, um, but, uh, and feel free guys to, to jump in uh, to augment what I say, but um, as I've mentioned before, you know, we have a specific, uh, we will put out specific topics and needs and requirements. And so um, the expectation is really that you have a solution that you're developing commercially that can address that need. Um, and that aligns perfectly with what we're, we're asking for too. Whether or not, you know, you've recently pivoted from, from one startup uh, or to another, um, really, it is going to be, you know, on our end as government reviewers of your application to, de to determine, you know, how mature, how far along are you in your product development? Um, could you get to a p proof of concept demonstration by the end of phase one in three to six months? Um, uh, and so that's that's a determining factor. You know, we, the government, will kind of assess and evaluate, you know, how far along you are in in um, in your pro on your product roadmap. Um, do you have, you know, partners in place to scale? Um, when the time comes, you know, like, and so there's a number of different um, elements in terms of us, the government making a determination of risk of whether or not uh, we see uh, um, that you have a, a strong chance of transitioning and commercializing that product. Anything else, uh, Andrew or Bob, you want to add to that? Nothing here. I think you got it. Okay, great. Thanks. But just want to make sure, you know, like as a startup, if am I, I'm speaking from the government's perspective, obviously. So if, if the startup has like, oh, well, you know, um, this is, you know, don't do that. Um, but um, all right, great. Um, let's see here. Uh, um, I think there's a couple of technical questions. I'm not sure. Um, like uh, there's a, a question here for Bob Bastille. Um, uh, can Bastille detect modulation of RF signals that are uh, one of theories for Havana syndrome? Um, intermodulation, distortion, fray effect, what parts of spectrum are you able to monitor and what can't you detect? So this is, um, this is kind of, I'd love to talk to that. Um, let's take that offline with that, uh, that questioner, spe specifically about the Havana syndrome microwave pulse detector. Um, I do have something to say about that, but I'm gonna, let's take it offline. We, we detect from 25 megs to six gigahertz. Um, that's, our, that's our range of detection. Just kind of the, the short answer. <laughs> sounds but, great. But please do reach out to me, Robert, and we can chat more. Awesome. Well, it sounds like you also have uh, some fellow uh, jackets uh, that are in the audience as well. So yeah. just representing. <laughs> That's great. All right, great. Um, let's see here. Uh, uh, it looks like this is a question for you, Andrew. Uh, what about beards, glasses, hats, cosmetic surgery, and other facial changes? What about aspect angles of images, which may or may not give you a false positive. So that really breaks down into two questions. One is the face matching part of it, and the other is the genuine presence. This used to face matching, which is, shall we say, the easy bit of all of this, that these, all those factors used to be absolutely devastating. Uh, since the introduction of, um, uh, of deep, deep learning convolutional neural networks into a face matching, those problems have largely gone away. Uh, our chief scientific officer has a has a tremendous beard, which meant that he has a very definite interest in ensuring that people who are bearded uh, pass. Um, different things like different pose, different aspects and so on, those are standard parts now of any kind of face matching system. And they, they work, it, it, modern deep learning systems uh, cope with them extremely well. The challenge was to make sure that the genuine presence uh, assurance system could work that way. Um, different poses, different, as much as anything, not just face furniture as we call it, but different lighting conditions. And the way we solved that was just that we accumulated between 2013 and 2018, a vast library just of people uh, having their faces illuminated by different devices from different angles and different lighting conditions with different sorts of face furniture. And that very large data set, which is actually a key competitive advantage of us, enabled us to build systems that uh, understood uh, those sorts of variations and could ignore them. I won't say compensate for them, 
good deep learning systems are trained to ignore the things that aren't important. Face furniture is not important. Lighting conditions are important in the way in which they interact with the illumination, but otherwise they shouldn't distort it. Pose and so on. So uh, had we been using um, traditional signal processing and algorithmic methods, which is the way that I started back in 2013, we wouldn't have stood a chance. The variations would have been far too great. Um, deep, learning, um, deep, deep learning means that the system is extremely robust to those variabilities in practice. And we know that just because of the statistics that come out of our system. Great, thanks, Andrew. Uh, I think this next question is for me. Um, can you address OTA funding and timing of payments to startups? Uh, is this based on established phases, deliverables, what? Um, great question. Um, and uh, uh, ultimately, so um, the way the, um, the, the the, the phases are structured and the app um, and the and the each each award is structured is they are fixed price uh, contracts meaning um, and and based on milestone and their milestone based payments so ultimately in the application um, I kind of I just very I, I glazed over this very quickly but to dive to dive a little bit further into it essentially in your application you would basically in addition to describing what your innovation is, what your product is, and how you would adapt it, that how you would adapt it part is is a work statement. You where you would describe, okay, these are the milestones that I need to achieve in order to um, to get to that you know phase one proof of concept demonstration, for example, right? Like here are, here are the milestones I need to achieve to show you that my product can be adapted to meet your use case and your requirement. Um, and so those milestones. Um, will be the points at which you're paid. And so if you have a successfully, if you, once you've successfully completed that milestone and maybe there are interim demonstrations or, um, or reports that you've, that you've provided that, um, that will prove out that you have completed that milestone, then you will get paid. Um, the government will, um, we will, the team will um, verify that the milestone has been completed, work with you, whether it's through meetings or whatnot um, and, 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 and determine that. Um, now, in terms of deliverables, that's very important. And actually, I'm glad you asked that because that is what um, the intellectual property is tied to. Um, we, uh, the SBB team, we're not interested in owning any of your intellectual property. We want to see that there's a commercial product that hits the marketplace. But in order for us to, we, the government, pay you to determine whether or not your solution is meeting our needs, we need some form of a deliverable to be received by the government. We can't, we can't, um, we can't, uh, pay you and get nothing out of it, right? So those deliverables that we look at are in, in the form of technical reports or um, technical data. So we're not looking for software necessarily because we don't wanna own that software. We don't want a widget that we're just gonna stick in a room somewhere, right? Um, but we need we need uh, something to prove that you've done this, um, uh, uh, performed the milestone. So in terms of deliverables, that's something that's, that, uh, that a company will be, need to be mindful of is here's your milestones and here's the deliverable associated with that milestone and um, and you'll get paid against that milestone and the IP that we receive is is a license of that report that we can share that report with others otherwise if we don't get a license of that report we can't actually share that with say a partner agency or something like that so um, very interesting nuances with the government um, and and the way the IP works but that's just how it looks um, and so for each phase um, each phase is a distinct contract. So once you're, if you're successfully in phase one, and we we like the progress that you're making, we'll invite the company to submit their phase two application, um, and uh, and 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 uh, and so on and so forth. Phase three, phase four. Um, so each each phase will be its own contract, um, and um, each phase will give the company an opportunity. Okay, once you've gone through phase one, now you have a better idea of what needs to occur in phase two. This is how you're going to lay out um, what your work statement, what your milestones, what, what that's going to look like and how you'd be paid. So hopefully that helps clear things up a little bit more. I know that that's like a lot of detail, but um, I think that's important for people who are interested. Melissa, could I just add one thing? Um, yeah. When dealing with governments, it's often very, it can be often be very worrying as to what the payment timings are going to be. And when you're a small company, cash flow is really, really important. Uh, and I, I was consistently impressed by the speed at which our invoices were paid. The, the contract, the OTA says 30 days, almost always they were paid significantly earlier than that um, following approval. So my, my compliments to the team, and it's a big plus when you're a small cash flow, cash flow limited company. Thanks, thanks for that. Yes, we are held to a pretty high standard, especially when it comes to small businesses, to making sure that we're paying invoices very quickly. Uh, in fact, if we don't, I think we owe you interest or something like that. So that's, a, that's another uh, carrot for the government to actually get the invoices paid quickly. Um, 
All right, let's see here. Uh, are there any limitations to participate in the program for small businesses that are more than 50% VC owned? Um, uh, I am not, I, I'm not uh, aware that that is a limitation of the, of the program um, in terms of eligibility. I think um, uh, there's, there's a very explicit language on what, uh, 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 what, um, what's defined as a non-traditional government contractor. Um, and we've provided some of that information as an FAQ on our website. So um, if you have more um, sort of every company I, I realize has a very unique case. Um, and so uh, if you have any specific questions about, about your ownership model or, or whatnot, and whether or not that counts, uh, counts you in or out as a non-traditional contractor, um, please shoot us an email and we can, we can get into that. But uh, good question. But in, in general, um, we're also not, um, so in terms of eligibility, that's important. In terms of whether or not you have VC backing is, is not a criteria. Um, uh, of whether or not you're eligible. Um, we have funded companies that have ha have been uh, bootstrapped um, and, uh, and and the like. So it you don't have to be VC backed in order to be eligible for the program. We, we tend to look at VC backing as a validation that there is a commercial um, drive behind that company and that solution. Um, and so that's that's a measure, but as the government, you know, we, as I mentioned, we're, we are looking for good solutions for problems. And in some cases, um, you know, if it's if the, if the solution's unique enough and it may not have VC backing or the, or the founder has chosen to, you know, remain uh, uh, um, uh, personally funding it, you know, that, that doesn't exclude you from being eligible. I know I've, I've been asked that question uh, a few times before too. Um, let's see here. Uh, can we contact Bob and or Andrew directly? How do you guys feel about that? Please, yeah, sure. Sure, absolutely. Happy All right, great. Uh, and I think uh, I think those of you that are on this uh, and registered, you'll get sort of a thank you email sometime uh, this week um, with uh, links and uh, to um, to the, the, the webinar as well as the presentation. And I think it will also include contact information um, for folks. Uh, great. Um, let's see here. Maybe this is potentially for Andrew, um, but maybe Bob, if, if you have any uh, comments on that. Oh, sorry, we're actually, sorry, I have lost track of time. We are very close to the end of our webinar and, uh, uh, and I wanna make sure that uh, we have enough time for the very end. Um, and it looks like uh, uh, Bob's email has been shared in the chat. Um, any last thoughts you guys have? Sorry for those questions that we did not get to. If, uh, please ask us, um, uh, send us a note uh, and we'll, we'll get to them later. Um, but any last comments, Bob or Andrew, that you have for, for the audience? No, just thanks for having us. Um, it's a pleasure being here today. Great. Thanks, all. My enthusiasm is unfeigned. <laughs> Very good. Mary Dresden, I think we can move to the next slide. Great. So as I, I kind of touched on the fact that we've got uh, a lot of information on our website, um, please take a look. The link is uh, there and, you know, and the link will be in the chat as well. Um, we've got information about eligibility, the application process, lots of FAQs. So please take a look there. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot us an email. Next slide, please. And uh, we are um, having a demo week that's scheduled for September 14th to 17th um, virtual. So please uh, send us an email to be added to our mailing list um, and we'll let you know when registration opens. It's a week long showcase of all the uh, a good number of the companies in our portfolio. So you get a flavor for um, who uh, the projects uh, and, and what they're working on. Next slide, please. Um, here's my contact information. Please shoot us an email. And if, if this program isn't for you, there's a number of other programs within s and um, that may uh, work. And, and if you're part of this webinar series, there are other programs that may be available. There's uh, the s and Innovation Inbox. Um, if we didn't get to your question, please send us a note with your question um, and uh, we'll get back to you. Next slide, please. Back to you, Connie. Okay, thanks, Melissa. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, if you do have any follow up questions, like Melissa said, please be sure to send us an email at that snt.innovation at hq.dhs.gov email. And we invite you to join us next month um, as we feature the Small Business Innovation Research Program, 
uh, from DHS. So uh, keep checking back on the website for that registration page. We'll also be sending out an email inviting you to that. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us today, and we hope to see you at our next Insights Outreach. Thanks.